Welcome. Today we're going to talk about inference in latent variable models, which is a very important topic when we talk about unsupervised learning. Specifically, we're going to talk about the variational Bayes methods. And in this category, we have two algorithms that we're going to look at. The first one is the fairly well-known and very popular EM algorithm, the expectation maximization algorithm. And the second one is the more recent variational autoencoder. More recent means there's still active research going on. And even our group has contributed to that research. And we will talk about our results a little later in this slide deck. Now with this topic, there's a lot of recommended readings. The first one is the standard literature, the Bishop uh, Pattern Recognition and Machine Learning book, which covers variational base and the expectation maximization algorithm really well. The problem is it doesn't cover the variational autoencoder at all because that's a too recent result. But uh, the nice thing about recent results in machine learning is that you have a lot of review papers, tutorial papers, and blog posts out there on the web. And all of these bullets are links that lead you to the respective posts. And that's a general recommendation. When you want to learn about a very modern machine learning algorithm, look at Reddit, look at the web, look at blog posts, because um, a lot of people struggle with learning these algorithms and um, quite a significant part of them puts up blog posts um, to help each other getting the key insights you need to understand these algorithms. And moreover, there are some um, ac actual research papers mentioned in these slides, and you can also have a look at them to see and get a feeling for how um, modern day research in machine learning is conducted. But now let's dive right into the topic. We will now look at a data set to learn more about uh, inference in latent variable models. And this data set is a very famous benchmark data set in machine learning. You can find it in a lot of papers. And this data set is called the MNIST handwritten digits data set and it's available th at this web page. And it consists of several tens of thousands of images, 28 by 28 pixels each, grayscale values, accompanied by a label about the digits uh, on these images. And it's labeled, so supervised learning is already, already really good at this data set. It outperforms hum humans in recognizing the digits uh, on the test set. Now, supervised learning is solved, but we actually want to learn something about unsupervised learning, so we're going to ignore, for a start, that there are labels available. So we're just going to look at the image data. And what do we do now? Well, we will just return to our standard recipe uh, that we've used throughout this lecture. And we're still using it, and it's still powerful, and that's maximum likelihood estimation. So we want to find a set of parameters such that the likelihood of the data given these parameters is maximized. Now, the very natural first question is maximum likelihood with respect to what model? So we need a model. So we need to ask ourselves what the underlying distribution of an image, given some parameters, might be. And now we run into a problem. So we have a bunch of distributions at hand, but our standard, standard set of distributions is not expressive enough. And what I've depicted uh, down here is the mean of the entire data set. So I, that's kind of an assumption of uh, a Gaussian distribution on the entire data set. And the mean looks something like this. So it looks like um, you combined all these images and it's one big blur and you can't see anything. So that already, already tells you that our standard set of distributions, in particular the Gaussian distribution, is not expressive enough. Now what can we do here? Now, this lecture wouldn't be called inference in latent variable models if we were not to talk about latent variables. And this is the slide where we will introduce the concept of latent and hidden variables. Well, the nature of a latent variable is that it's not directly observable for a machine. Now, you might say, well, I look at this image and I immediately see that it's an 8. But what your brain has done is quite some decoding here because what your brain actually gets from your retina 
is these type of light intensity values that's actually very similar to what the computer sees. And at least to me, it's not entirely clear or not obvious that uh, this uh, set or this matrix of light intensity values should be an 8. But how can we extract from this bunch of numbers that there is an 8 present? Well, um, there are latent factors there. So the, one of these latent factors is the abstract digit um, that can be seen in the image. And uh, one of the first insights is that these latent factors are somehow related uh, to labels, with some exceptions. Labels in supervised learning are typically incomplete. So uh, there are actually more latent factors available um, than the digit, for example, the skewness or the rotation of the digit. So you would still uh, be able to recognize this 8, even if I rotated it by maybe 30 degrees. And the thing is that labels are typically missing. So in most interesting data sets uh, these days, you don't have complete labels, or sometimes you don't even have any labels. So that's the big difference between labels and the latent factors, but they are somewhat related. The thing is, if we knew these latent factors, our lives would get consider considerably easier. So uh, what I've done in this picture at the bottom is I've taken the labels and I've sorted uh, all the samples in the MNIST data set by their label. And then I took the mean of all zeros, of all ones, of all twos, and so on. And what you can see is fairly readable means. So if we knew the label data, our life would get much, much easier. And we will need to formalize this concept to do inference and to try to detect um, these latent factors. On the previous slide, we saw that the distribution of the images given some further information, for example, given the label, is much easier. We can just use our standard methodology with um, Gaussian distributions, for example. Now, this extra information is, of course, not given to us, but we can use this as a working hypothesis. So the hypothesis is that this distribution is much easier. Um, and this directly leads to the so-called graphical model perspective. That sounds a bit more complicated than it is, because we have already depicted a graphical model here um, on the right hand side and a graphical model is just a graph um, that shows you the relationship between um, certain random variables or in this case random vectors and this is the most simple graphical model you can come up with it consists of two random vectors and one arc one directed arc between the two and this, the direction of the arc tells you um, which random variable is influenced by which other. Um, you should be a bit careful here. This does not mean that there is a causal implication. Um, it's just some kind of influence. And what this means um, can be seen in the equations on the left-hand side. Okay, so we start off with um, the distribution that we want to do maximum likelihood estimation on. That is the marginal distribution on the images. And then we do three standard operations we've seen uh, previously. So uh, we marginalize out z and thus get the joint in the integral. And then we can split it up in two different ways, which are both valid for all distributions. And um, in the first one, we pull out x first. And in the second one, we pull out z first. And now all the graphical model does is it tells you that z influences x. So you should use this distribution, the, the last distribution, because this distribution um, x, given the influence in factors z, is much easier. Okay, That's exactly the same f finding as on the previous slide, that um, the distribution of the images is much easier if I know that all images show a 7. Okay, so this uh, last version will be a working horse um, for the next few slides. What you should also keep in mind, though, is that the second line here is also still interesting. Why is that? Well, this deck of slides is called inference in latent variable models. And when you want to do inference, 
you just take the observables and you want to infer the latent reasons, the latent factors. And that is what is encoded by this posterior distribution of the latents given the observables. So this is a particularly hard distribution, um, but that's ultimately our goal. But our working horse will be the other direction. And that's what the graphical model tells you. Okay. And the way to interpret this is that we're still doing maximum likelihood estimation. It's just that we have a model where some data is missing. For example, the abstract digit is missing, and that's what we'll assume for the next few slides. But I already told you this is a model assumption, um, and you can easily see different uh, latent factors in this MNIST data set, for example, such as the position on the canvas, the rotation, the skewness, and so on. So um, it's a simplified model, but it will turn out to be fairly powerful. We've learned about graphical models, and now we can already look at a simple but still very powerful example. And let's look at it in the context of our MNIST example. We've already seen that if we knew the digit, which we now encode as a latent variable z, so z is uh, in the set of digits from 0 to 9, if you knew this digit, then we could still use our standard methodology, namely a Gaussian distribution. So that's what we do. Given this uh, unknown digit k, x follows a Gaussian distribution with a specific mean mu k for this digit and a specific covariance. And because we need the joint distribution um, in order to marginalize it out, this latent variable, we also need a prior on the distribution and that's a discrete random variable because we have 10 discrete states. And that means we just have a vector of probabilities, pi k. And these pi k's, they need to sum up to 1, obviously, and they also need to be non-negative because they are uh, direct probabilities. And that's all that comprises a Gaussian mixture model, in this case with 10 components, but you can in principle have arbitrarily many of them. So uh, let's look at it in total. Um, we started off and wanted to have this marginal distribution on the images, given some parameters. Um, we found that the images are hard to model, so we introduced this latent variable z and integrated it out. And um, we used these assumptions, and then we have this analogy between integrating out a random variable and summing out a discrete random variable, and what we end up with is a mixture of Gaussians. So we add up um, 10 Gaussians and we scale them down by the probability that is assigned to each class. And just to summarize, now the learnable parameters on which we want to perform maximum likelihood estimation are of course these mixture weights and um, the parameters of the individual Gaussian distributions. Okay, um, one comment on Gaussian mixture model. This seems like a simple model, but they are actually very powerful. So um, assuming you have enough components, and that's always the caveat, how many components do you need? And uh, typically you need a lot of them. But um, assuming that, you can in principle model any um, distribution that is there. there. So uh, given that you have enough components, you can make the difference to any distribution arbitrarily small. Now we can do maximum likelihood estimation now. So um, the maximum likelihood estimate is exactly the argmax of this log likelihood of the data given the parameters. But now we, we run into a problem. And this problem is that this integral here, or this sum here, is inside this logarithm. And if you remember your logarithm rules, a product would be nice, but a sum inside the logarithm cannot be simplified. Okay. There are numerical tricks to that, but there is no analytical trick that we can apply here. And the problem is that we can't find a closed form solution for this anymore, as we did in all the previous cases. So you remember, for maximum likelihood estimation for a Gaussian, one Gaussian, there's a closed form solution for the mean, for example. But that's not possible for a Gaussian mixture model. And that's where it gets interesting. One thing to remember here is that this is maybe not too surprising because, uh, after all, there is data missing. Uh, 
And then there must be a price to pay somewhere. And this is exactly where we have to pay the price for not having all the data, namely that the optimization gets harder, but it also gets more interesting. And that's what we'll have a look at now. So apparently maximum likelihood estimation and optimization is hard for Gaussian mixture models. But then we recall that Gaussian distributions themselves are fairly easy. So just to recap that, if we knew this label z, if we knew the digit, we could circumvent all these problems with the integrals or the sums um, in the following way. We would start off by just counting the number of samples in class k, that's this variable nk, and here's a very fancy way of writing that you count the number of samples. And then you would look at each class individually and um, conclude that the maximum likelihood estimate is just the average of the samples in this class. Fairly straightforward and the same applies to the covariance matrix. It's not written on the slide, but it's um, a straightforward application of this principle. And then you can also look at the mixture components pi k and it's fairly easy to understand that the maximum likelihood estimation for them is just the number of samples in class k um, over the total number of samples. That is the fraction of samples in the entire data set that belong to class k. Okay. But of course this number nk of samples in class k is not given to us, which is a direct consequence of the missing labels. But we can see that there's something fairly close to that. Um, and to see that, we can maybe first talk about how a label is typically encoded. So typically you have a one hot vector, which means that um, you have a vector that is all zeros. And uh, except for the kth entry in this vector, which is a one if and only if uh, this sample belongs to class K. And instead of this one hot encoding, we replace it with a softer encoding. It's again a vector of the same size, but um, all entries can be between zero and one, that is their probabilities. And that's exactly this posterior distribution. So this posterior distribution tells us our current belief that the sample Xn belongs to class K. And this needn't be one hot, it can be one hot if we were very certain, but it's a softer encoding. And because this is our current belief, which class is responsible for uh, creating the sample X, these things are called responsibilities, and that's why they're denoted by R. And just to um, understand the notation here, we have the responsibilities and they're indexed by the sample index N and the class index K. So they have two indices and they depend on the parameters uh, theta that we're trying to optimize for. Okay, so this is a fairly good uh, replacement for the missing one hot labels, but there's also a problem with that. And that problem is that we now have a cycle. Why is that? Well, as we've seen, we need these parameters theta in order to calculate the responsibilities. Okay, but also we need these responsibilities to optimize for theta. So we need the responsibilities and theta to calculate one another. And that makes it hard and that's actually the reason why we can't find a closed form solution. We have this cycle where always something's missing. That sounds like a problem now, but on the next slides we'll see how to actually exploit this fact.